the line of fire with dr michael brown salem radio networks channel sr2 90 seconds from mark 90 seconds stations is now one minute before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with dr michael brown one minute from mark one minute stations now the final time check before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with dr michael brown 30 seconds until hour number one from mark that was our final verbal time check for the line of fire with dr michael brown we'll have a long tone at 10 seconds before followed by a short one at five seconds have a great afternoon everybody Friends, I've got some real encouragement for you today. Are you ready? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Do you remember the account in Acts, the third chapter, where Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray. And there's a man begging by the temple gate. He is lame since birth and he's begging for alms. That's how he lives. People give him money and he survives. And he looks at Peter and John and they, they look right back at him and he's expecting re to receive money from them. And Peter says, I don't have any silver and gold, but what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk, and the man is instantly, miraculously healed. You can't give what you don't have, but you can give what you do have. And God has given me something over the years, imparted something to me, gifted me with something that I can give to you. And I'm going to do that today on the line of fire. Hey, friends, thanks for joining us. This is Michael Brown, the number to call. If you want to weigh in on what we're talking about today, or if you just have any other question you want to ask me, talk about something in the Bible or culture, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. That is the number to call. I, I want to encourage you in tangible ways today, and I, I want to talk about something special that God has gifted me with that I can gift you with. You know, everybody has strengths from the Lord, spiritual gifts from the Lord as we walk with him. We all have weaknesses. And what we do is, is we find out how we're really called and how the Lord could best use us to help others. And we give ourselves to that. I mean, if you are a really gifted teacher, you just love to dig, 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 dig deep in the word and unpack things and uncover things. You can't wait to share them with other interested believers. You're the wrong person to lead an evangelistic campaign of street preachers because that's not your strength and, and that's not your gifting and that's not what moves you. Yeah, you should be a witness to the lost, but, but you're not going to be able to lead that other group and, and do it with anointing and grace because it's, it's not your calling. The same way, if you just got to reach the lost, got to reach the lost, got to reach the lost, got to bring them the gospel, they're dying, they don't know Jesus. And that's, what, that's, that's who you are. Well, you're not going to be the right person to develop the the curriculum for in-depth study of scriptures in, in your church Bible school. Because you're like, we, we got to be reaching the lost. Why are we spending all our time reading the Bible? We got to be reaching the lost. So we each have gifts like that. Uh, some people, I mean, their gift, Paul talks about Romans 12, is, is showing mercy. And, and you're just, you are Mr. or Miss Compassion. And that, 
you are just kind and, and, and that's your gift. You go up to people who are hurting, you just say, hey, I'm pray- I love you, I'm praying for you, standing with you, and we're going to get through this together. Like, thank you, I needed that. Well, you don't put that person in charge of, of like having to discipline wayward people in the church. You know, conversely, if, if, if your gift is, is leading, you don't put that person in a major thing where you just serve, 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 serve. If your gift is serving, you don't just put that person in a leading role, although we all serve, we all give, we all have compassion, but we have special gifts from God. And based on those gifts, we can minister effectively to others. And many of us function in different ways. You may be a teacher and a preacher. You, you may be a, a pastor and, 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 and have a prophetic side. We, we have different aspects to who we are. And part of my calling is to teach, to open the scriptures, you know, writing commentaries on biblical books, digging deep into controversial subjects in scripture, opening up the languages, doing sound exegesis. That's part of my calling. It's also part of my calling to, to bring a wake-up call to the church, you know, to preach the message of repentance, to, to stir sparks of revival. But something struck me, oh, about 15 years ago. We were having a faculty staff fellowship at Fire School of Ministry. If you want to take classes, it's exclusively online now, fireschoolofministry.com, fireschoolofministry.com. Worth checking out. Trust me. Fabulous faculty, fabulous classes, now entirely online. So we were having a meeting, and we had one really creative gal on our staff. And she said, okay, I want all of you to take these little blocks, like the Lego blocks, you know, that just stick together, whatever, right? And she gave one to each of us. And the, the thing was, okay, we're all building something together, right? And she said, I want each of you to pray and think about in one word what you bring to Fire School of Ministry, the unique thing that you bring. So I'm the director, founder, director of the school, got an amazing faculty, leadership team, staff, incredible people. So I'm thinking, okay, what's, I said, well, obviously vision, vision because you know, I'm the visionary leader, and I think, no, no, there are others with vision too. There's something unique that I bring. And we had been through many financial challenges with the school that we had birthed and, and our, our mission's vision, and really low tuition, and we had been through many financial challenges. So we had many, many seasons where we had no money. And everyone said, staff's like, hey, we're in this together. We're going to believe God together. Or some worked weekends so that they could – uh, or we go out and preach and minister, and that would supply needs for ministry, and then we didn't have to get paid by the school, and the staff sacrificed in amazing ways. I, I mean, they've got great, great treasure in heaven, and all the people I helped us train and equip out in the field, praise God for that. Wonderful. Good news. I thought, okay, we, we, we have to go through a lot of adversity, and then the calling to tackle the difficult things. I thought, if I had to boil down the, 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 the thing that I bring most to our organization, it was courage. It was the word courage. I thought, that's it. That because, uh, you know, you, you get hit. There's an onslaught. God's not with us. Things are failing. We're not going to be able to make it. Can't pay our bills. Uh, not going to have new students. Uh, this, this endeavor, this outreach is going to fail. There's too much opposition, demonic pressure. It, if you've ever been through hellish times, it gets intense. I mean, the, the best of us, you, you, you want to cave in. You know, Elijah the prophet after the great calling down a fire of Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18, what happens? He, he runs from Jezebel. He's had it. He's fearful. And run, you know, there's, there's that prophetic fallout after a great event and great victory that, that sometimes you just, you're vulnerable and boom. And I knew that's the, that's the key thing that I bring is courage. And with that, a spirit of faith. And, and if you've listened to me over the years, you know as much as we warn about what's happening in the culture and what's happening in the world and the backslidden state of so much of the church, we tell it like it is. We, we do not tickle ears here. That's why, you, that's why you're listening. At the same time, you're not going to walk away hopeless. You're not going to walk away in despair. You're not going to walk away and say, let's throw in the towel. You're going to walk away with a deeper courage and a deeper resolve. And, and as, as friends of mine, on a regular basis, risk their lives for the gospel, and as I've had the privilege of literally risking my life for the gospel, I, I can speak to you with some level of authority and, and say, God is with us, and if God is with us, it doesn't matter if the whole world is against us. 
If God is with us, it doesn't matter if every social media channel blocks us. It doesn't matter if the media blacklists us. Blacklists us. It doesn't matter if the political parties ignore us. It, it doesn't matter what guns or knives or bombs the opposition has. If God is with us, that's all we need to know. And no matter what we go through, what trial, what test, what opposition, what hardship, what difficulty, no matter what we go through, if we know and are sure that God is with us, that we, his children, are here to make him known and he is with us. That's all we need to know. And, and I want to speak to you with what God has given to me and give it to you and say, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. I've often wondered why God told that to Joshua over and over in Joshua 1 after Moses died. And it could be that Joshua now, he's, he's a, an older man. He's got to be at least 60, at the very least, at least 60, but most likely substantially older than that. He's been with Moses the whole time. Everything that's happened, Moses has been the man. He was ready. We can take the land. We can do it, right? Read it, Numbers 13, 14. We can do it, he and Caleb. But now it's, you watch the whole generation die in the wilderness, everybody his age, everybody except him and Caleb. They're all dead in the wilderness. And now Moses is dead. And now he's got to do it. Maybe in himself he was weak. Maybe in himself he had doubts and questions. One of the great lessons God's taught me is, is to see my weaknesses as an opportunity for his strength. Rather than thinking, I can do it. I can do it. Mike Brown's strong. I, no, no. It's like, I am so weak in myself and, and so helpless in myself. So God's strength can be manifest through me. So I, I'm going to ride his wave. I'm going to be strong in, in his power. Isn't that what Ephesians 6 says? Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So I want to speak to every pastor, every leader, every parent, every single person, every student, every person in the business world, everyone out on the streets preaching, whoever you are in America and around the world, I want to speak to you and say, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You've been raised up for this hour. God put you here in this world, in this hour. It's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. It's the plan of God. It is your time of destiny to do the will of God and make a difference. And as surely as I am speaking to you, we will see a holy pushback in our society. I've been saying this for over 20 years. I don't know how far it will go. I don't know how extensive the pushback will be, but I guarantee you, as surely as I'm sitting here, from everything I sense and understand and what I can see in the culture around us, that the pushback is rising. The people are saying enough is enough. I'm not talking about a violent pushback. I'm not talking about taking up arms, Weapons. No, I'm, I'm talking about people saying enough is enough to the destruction of the culture. Uh, enough is enough to what's happening in the world around us and, and radical ideologies and, and radical activist mindsets. The people are saying enough is enough. Those who were reluctant to stand, we've been urging them to stand for years and years. They've been reluctant. And, I don't want to just you get your hands dirty. It's messy. People attack you. They don't like you. I just rather love people, be nice, not have to get involved in the culture wars and all this. Well, it's it's come to us. It's come it's come to us to the point that you can't ignore it. You can't ignore it in your home, in your kids' school, in your church setting. You can't ignore it. But it's not time for hatred or anger. It's time for righteous resistance. Meaning, we're going to do what's right regardless of cost or consequence. We're going to love our neighbor. We're going to bless those who curse us. We're not going to hate our enemy. We're going to overcome evil with good, but we're going to stand for what is right. Let your backbone be strengthened today. Let this be you, hearts of compassion, backbones of steel. Let me say it again. Hearts of compassion, backbones of steel. The holy uprising is continuing. The famous Balfour Declaration, what exactly was it? Well, it was in 1917, and it was a British declaration saying that there would be a national homeland for the Jews in Palestine. 
You have to remember the whole land was dubbed Palestine in the second century after the destruction of Jerusalem. And now Hadrian is going to dub the whole land, what was Israel, call it Palestine. So that would be a degrading term. But then that just was what it was known for, the land of the Philistines, Palestine. But there had always been a Jewish presence there. At that time, so you're talking about now the time of World War I, in, in, the, in the centuries previous to this, this was just part of, of the Ottoman Empire, all right? Now with shifts in World War I, and now there's colonization, and now Western powers kind of carving up the Middle East and things like that, this were some of the nation states we have today were, were first birthed in those ways because they were just tribal peoples living in different regions. Now things got carved out a certain way. Well, what about the Jews? Well, this is their ancient homeland. So let's look to give them a national homeland in Palestine. This was all that was envisioned. It was a very positive step forward and looked at historically. So amazingly, we just passed a few years ago now, the 100th anniversary of this declaration associated with Lord Balfour. Unfortunately, over a period of years, the United Kingdom, Great Britain changed its tune. And instead of being as fully sponsoring of this concept, there was a shift. And to this day, you can even see much more pro-Christian Zionist thought in America than you can in England, because Zionism is still looked at negatively in many ways because of a shift that took place, especially with the birthing of modern Israel. But the Balfour Declaration, very important, 1917, and helped set the tone for what happened today. Cleansing flame, send the fire. It's the line of fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. At the bottom of the hour, I am going to be joined by a street preacher from Tennessee who got a burden to make a difference in the state where he lives, not just preaching the gospel, but working legislatively. So we're going to talk about that. But first, let me go over to an article that I posted yesterday with examples of how the cultural tide is turning. I'm not just speaking words of faith and encouragement into thin air or out of thin air, but rather based on heart conviction plus what I'm seeing in the world around us, all right? So uh, the article is, is on our website, sdrbrown.org or stream.org and other websites. The cultural tide is turning. And I say this, in the midst of our dangerous, steady descent into cultural madness, there are signs of encouragement as well. The morally based, rationally grounded resistance is rising. More and more people are saying enough is enough. Even the liberal media is giving voice to this dissent. But this is what many of us have been expecting for years. If you have my book, Outlasting the Gay Revolution, it's on that very theme. Here's what's happening in society. Here's how we outlast it and see change. Knowing that the cultural radicals would overplay their hand. A pushback has been inevitable as witnessed by these recent examples. It's the breaking point. It's when people say enough is enough. So how about this? First, consider this op-ed published May 24th in where? USA Today. So secular publication, certainly left-leaning as opposed to right-leaning, but secular in any case. Uh, it's by Chelsea Mitchell titled, I was the fastest girl in Connecticut, but transgender athletes made it an unfair fight. She explains that despite being ranked the fastest 55-meter 55 55 female runner in her state, time after time she has been losing big races. So think of that. You're the fastest in your state. You got scholarships ahead. You plan on going to college with athletic scholarships. Maybe you, you want to go to the Olympics one day. Who knows? This is you've been working at it, right? Um, and, and then you start losing races consistently. Why? She's been racing against biological males. So here's here's what she says. She says I've I've lost four women's state championship titles, two All New England awards, and numerous other spots on the podium to transgender runners. I was bumped to third place in the 55-meter dash in 2019 behind two transgender runners. With every loss, it gets harder and harder to try again. I mean, it's, it's disheartening. She's doing everything she can as a biological female to do the best she can. And biological males, many of them are not even near the top with the other guys. They're like mediocre or towards the bottom, but they can beat the, the ladies because of biology. This is outrageous as it is unfair, and soon enough it will reach the breaking point as the world's best female athletes lose to mediocre male athletes who identify as female. 
will the next Olympic Games, if they're held soon despite the COVID outbreak in Japan, mark that breaking point? Either way, it's coming. So that's my first example. My first example is to say states now, whole states are passing laws saying biological males cannot compete with biological females. It's a matter of fairness. It's that simple. If this guy is convinced he's a girl and wants to identify as a girl, that's it's his choice to make, but he cannot impose that on the other ladies. It does not give him the right to now participate with females in sports. It is simply not fair. And for USA Today to run that editorial, obviously the voices are rising. Okay, example number two, 60 Minutes. This is just within the last few days. Uh, there are now so many young adults regretting their decision to become transgender that the last episode of 60 Minutes devoted time to the subject of detransitioning. In response to this powerful segment, one which goes against the normal trans-celebratory mood of the liberal media, Kira Bell tweeted, I stand behind you all. I can see how difficult that was for all of you to speak on. Honest, raw, and powerful. I can only hope that viewers will pay attention and read between the lines. Stop the lies. So Kira Bell's own story, I shared some of it on the air a week or two ago. I had a I had to stop because I was going to break down crying. Just the pain of what she went through transitioning to male, recognizing the mistakes she made, transitioning back to female, but with negative lifelong effects on her as a woman. So naturally, trans activists and their allies are upset with 60 Minutes for airing these stories. But you can be sure of this. If there were not a lot of young people regretting the tragic, life-altering decisions they made, 60 Minutes would not have offered such a sympathetic treatment. You can be sure of that, friends. The cultural tide is turning. Things are happening. And and then I mentioned this. In February of this year, Newsweek printed the gut-wrenching story of Scott Nugent, herself a female to male, transgender. So a female who uh, goes by the name Scott now. The op-ed was titled, We Need Balance When It Comes to Gender Dysphoric Kids, I Would Know. Nugent ended the article with this powerful plea. This is... Scott Nugent is not a born-again Christian or fundamentalist or anything. I am currently building a bipartisan army to protect our children, hold the medical industry accountable, and educate our president and the rest of society about the dangers of transgender extremism. We must throw our differences aside for a moment. I promise you, once children are safe, we can resume fighting. But until children are safe, nothing else matters. So I wrote an article favorably. Nugent reached out to me. We've interacted numerous times via email, spoke by phone. So we are who we are. Here I am referring to, to Scott as, as she, okay, fully understanding that. Uh, and, and Scott Nugent is saying we must expose what's happening to the children. And Newsweek published this. So look at this. Explain how we, we've interacted. The diverse coalition, the diverse coalition is growing. What is tragic, though, is that it took two years for Nugent to find a major secular publication willing to carry her well-documented article. What is positive is that Newsweek did decide to publish it. These stories must be told and will be told. As a result, the pushback will only intensify. And then next, a retired professor has been removed from an American Psychological Association email discussion group after challenging the idea that there are more than two biological sexes. Now you say, well, why is that? positive because the thing is just going to continue to get overplayed and the pushback is going to come. As reported by College Fix, John Stadden, an emeritus professor of psychology and neuroscience at Duke University, was taken off the Society for Behavioral Neuroscience and Comparative Psychology Division 6 listserv overseen by the APA, American Psychological Association. This group is devoted to, quote, studying the biology of behavior. Their focus is on behavior and its relation to perception, learning, memory, cognition, motivation, and emotion. As Staden explained, this incident just illustrates the current inability of some scientific communities to tolerate dissent about issues related to sex and race. Psychology and sociology seem to be especially flawed in this respect. And according to Staden, what likely got him taken off this, this list was this post. Hmm. Binary view of sex false, meaning male, female sex. What is the evidence? Is there a Z chromosome? What? Only two biological sexes? For saying this, he got banned. All right? So, again, it's a negative example. 
But the positive to me is when people are getting this extreme and banning you from an email list for saying that there are only two sexes, you know this can only go so far before it has to bounce back. Ben Shapiro has often reminded us facts don't care about your feelings. Ryan Anderson and others have reminded us that biology is not bigotry. Reality cannot be denied for long. So look, here's what happened. Americans want to be fair-minded. It, it bothers us when, when discrimination is pointed out to us. We're ashamed of our past treatment of African Americans. We're ashamed of our past treatment of Native Americans. We're, we're ashamed when, when people expose things that are ugly in our past or in our present. We don't want to be bigoted. We don't want to be racist. We don't want to be discriminatory. The vast majority of Americans, that's our heart, right? You do have racists on all sides and bigots and things, but my heart, I care about every individual. If, if, if I could help a gay neighbor and, and they were struggling in a certain area, you know, maybe needed to be driven to the hospital, you know, and had gotten a car accident and didn't have anyone to care for them and got a car accident and they, they need therapy to learn to walk again. And I had the opportunity to drive that person to the hospital, time and opportunity to do it. I was a neighbor. Well, what a privilege to help someone in need, right? I'm not going to say, well, I'm going to help you because you're gay. I'm going to help. No. What true follower of Jesus would think like that? Help whoever you can help, love whoever you can love. Be, be a blessing in people's lives if you can. At the same time, no, I'm not going to redefine marriage based on that. At the same time, let's say it was a transgender neighbor that got in a car accident, needed someone to take it to the hospital. Great opportunity for me to show you the love of God. But I am not now going to affirm the rightness of a male identifying as a female or vice versa. So what happened with many Americans is, as I believe, people wanted to do right. They wanted to be helpful. They have gay friends neighbors, family members, they thought, well, yeah, I mean, they should be able to marry the one they love. And I don't want to be bigoted. I don't, I don't want to be towards them the way, you know, we were to blacks with segregation or others. And, you know, so you have that, that positive attitude of wanting to do right. Then it's like, well, I didn't, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't realize that redefining marriage would now be a direct attack on our religious freedoms. I, I didn't realize it was now going to come to a 15 year old boy sharing the locker room with my 15 year old daughter. I, whoa, I, I didn't sign up for that. And that's what's happening. And, and that's why we were warning from day one the consequences, the results of activists on the other side. So let me proclaim again, Jesus died for everyone the same. Gay, straight, black, white, Jew, Gentile, whoever. He died for everyone the same, shed the same blood for all of us, offers all of us salvation and new life through the gospel, through the cross. At the same time, as followers of Jesus, we stand up for what is right and best in our society. So make a difference where you live, in your school, in your place of business, in your church setting. Stand up, be strong. If they cut us, we should bleed love. That's who should we should be, full of love to the core and also full of courage and full of conviction. We'll be right back. Have you ever heard it said there's no such thing as an atheist, that no real atheist exists, that everybody really knows there's a God? Well, I don't agree with that. And my wife, Nancy, who was an atheist when we met at 19 and a hardcore atheist that that had been ever since she was maybe eight years old, she absolutely takes offense in that statement. Now, if you mean scientifically that it's impossible to prove the non-existence of God and therefore you cannot scientifically typically demonstrate that. Okay, that's another subject. But are there people who sincerely and genuinely in the heart of hearts do not believe that there is a God, that there's anything beyond the material realm? Certainly. Do some of them hate the God? They deny. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, in the Ten Commandments, God speaks about the idols. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So, yes, there are some people who hate God. They see who he is. They see what he stands for. They believe he's real, and they hate him. 
There are others that deny his existence, but act as if they hate him. You know, the summary of many of the new atheist books, the Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens books, the the best summary of some of them is, there is no God and I hate him. So there are some people who hate what this God stands for or hate what they believe this God has done in the name of religion or hate the God of the Old Testament, but they deny his existence. So that's an interesting thing. But, But there are other atheists that simply intellectually or experientially don't believe there's a God. And they don't go around hostile and angry towards him all the time. That's a fact. And there are others, and I want to appeal to this, who I believe have a very high and lofty view of God and think that if this God existed, who was so good, who was so perfect, who was so powerful, he couldn't possibly allow the suffering and pain in this world. He would have to intervene more than he has. So I believe for some atheists, Their rejection of God is because of a pain in their heart, not so much an anger, but they prayed and didn't find an answer, that they once believed the Bible, but it seemed in their critical, deepest, darkest moment that this God let them down. Or they just hurt so much for a hurting human race, they can't understand how an omnipotent, loving being with all wisdom and all foreknowledge could let this happen, let a world be like this. So... I believe there's much to appeal to in those people and to say the God you dream about is actually real beyond your wildest dreams. You just don't have the capacity to fully understand him. I want to introduce you to that God. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the Line of Fire. This is Michael Brown. Delighted to be with you. 866-34-TRUTH is the number to call. You know, many things in our, in our life in the Lord come down to emphasis, they, they come down to how much we do a particular thing, how passionately we do a particular thing, how much of our time, energies it takes. And uh, what happened with much of the church in the last four or five years is we got overly politicized. We, we put so much focus on who is in the White House and getting certain people in the courts and getting certain bills passed that – That became the priority rather than seeking God in prayer, personal repentance, sharing the gospel with the lost, making a difference where we live in our communities, that that we we made something that was secondary primary, and that meant that we forgot about the primary. But on the flip side, for many years, the church would all but abandon the political process and put all of its emphasis on, say, we have to win the lost, make disciples, which is obviously the priority, but then forgot to say, let's make sure this fleshes out into our communities in every area of life. So I'm joined now by Rich Pankowski. He leads Warriors for Christ Ministries. He's a street preacher with a small army of street preachers that relate and go out and preach in the gospel uh, all around America on the streets. And uh, we understand and agree, Rich and I and others, that the the greatest priority is ultimately winning the lost. I mean, we love God with all of our heart, love our neighbors ourselves, and that means sharing the gospel with those who don't know the Lord. But that's not the only thing we're called to do. We're called to make disciples. And then as disciples, how do we ourselves live? So something's just taken place in the state of Tennessee. There's a strong Christian governor there. Uh, met him at a church service. Oh, years something ago and met his pastor that's known for many, many years. So you've got someone that's willing to sign a bill that can be a righteous bill, which is very positive. But um, Rich, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Great to have you on the line of fire. Appreciate you taking the time to come on. Hey, Dr. Brown, how are you? Doing doing well. All right. so, So first, before we talk about political activism and a bill that you were involved with in Tennessee, Talk about your burden as, as a street preacher, because you are not primarily politically oriented. You're primarily out there preaching repentance on the streets, correct? Correct. All right. And we travel the 
we we traveled the country, and what what really got us going was these drag queen story events and the things that we've seen that happen there, the sexualizing of children. This has been the burden that's been on me personally is seeing this stuff happening, and the church just not pushing back. And you know, we just decided and we prayed about it, and the Lord put on put on my heart, go out and do it, uh, because somebody's got to protect these kids. All right, so it was. Just like for me, getting the burden about LGBT activism happened through confrontation of seeing what was happening in society around us. So this is not like the kind of thing that you think, hey, let's start this organization or ministry or dealing with this. It's You were confronted with it. What, what are some of the things when you talk about the sexualizing of children and drag queen story events where these drag queens are reading to toddlers in, in city libraries? What are some of the things that, that you encountered? It's not, it's not just reading. Uh, reading is actually, it seems to be just the catalyst that brings them in, but we have actually taken video and pictures of the LGBT groups that go there dressing up little boys into what look like hookers, fishnet stockings, those little, uh, what do they call them, Daisy Duke shorts, little crop tops. Um, we see this all over the place. We've heard, we, we hear the language of what drag queens are saying to children, uh, the, the, the disgusting language, the using... I say is using foul words to describe anatomy, talking about sexual things, having little children give dollar bills and shoving them down the pants of of men dressed in women's underwear. And we've seen we've shown video, uh, we've shot video, we've taken screenshots, and we've we've actually sent those videos and screenshots to our state legislators and to state legislators across the country where these events are taking place. Yeah, and there's there's video, you know, here drag queens, here's how we shake our hips and do this and. I mean, it's it's utter madness. You think it's another world, and the parents are there bringing their kids, and it's this great event. And then some of these involved have been exposed now as sexual predators, correct? That is correct, and we've actually been involved in that, particularly in Houston, Texas. Uh, there were two of them down there, and then what most recently there was one uh, that was just happened in Ohio, Middleton, Ohio, uh, which you'll hear about later on today, uh, where a uh, LGBT supporter put on a uh, a prosthetic male appendage and started uh, making sexual motions in front of children and had a teenager simulate. Uh, Got it. Uh, with her hand. With her, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously difficult to have this conversation in a way that's not X rated, but just think of that. We can't talk about it on public radio because it's too obscene. Because it's, it's, right. it's and, too. And, and the last thing we want to talk about, but this is, this is what kids are being exposed to. Okay, so. You get burdened by this. Obviously, you're going to preach all the more, ramp up the repentance preaching, call people to new life in yeah. Jesus. But what else did you feel led to do living in Tennessee? Well, living in Tennessee, you know, I, living here, you know, we have it, – it's a great state for Christians because, you know, we have a police department that will actually let us pray for them on the streets. Mm. Uh, we have a police department that as long as – again, when we're preaching, uh, we're not violent. They they, they pretty much leave us alone and thank us for what we do. Uh, but we also went a step further and said, you know what? We have a super Republican majority here in Tennessee, most of whom profess to be Christians. We need to go talk to them. And that's exactly what we've done. We go up to the Capitol building. We meet with them individually. We meet with them privately. I have discussions with the governor and the governor's office. Uh, matter of fact, we just had that uh, street picture conference, and one of our senators actually came and spoke to it at it. Mm. Um you know, we've got we've gone up to the Capitol building because most people don't realize that those buildings are public buildings. We have a right to be in there and to speak. So we've actually went to the cafeteria and stood there and rebuked Planned Parenthood in the cafeteria. And it makes an impact. And, and, and friends, remember that Rich is not doing this as, say, a megachurch pastor who maybe has had all kinds of, of outreach works, you know, for decades in the community and and. In other words, it's not like you have to earn your way up a certain rung or have a certain number of people. These are care, consider, These are citizens who care. These are gospel preachers who say, "Hey, we're supposed to make a difference here." So you're not you're not going in threatening these people. You're not. This was not an insurrection. You didn't go in there with with guns and knives. You're going in there and saying, "Hey, look at what's happening in our community. Can we talk about this?" So, what kind of reactions did you get? Mostly positive. We, we, when we sit down with them and we show them the photos and we show them the videos, and again, these are not clips. We give them the entire video so that nobody can claim that they've been edited, yep. uh, you know, so that it, out of context. We will sit down with them. We will email them. 
And we have found that most of our lawmakers here in Tennessee will actually look at the videos. When they see the screenshots, when they see the screenshots of the actual message that we receive from these LGBT groups here in Tennessee, the vitriol, the hate, the, uh, again, the sexual them children, they actually sit, they, they can't believe this is taking place. Um, and, and they, they want to do something about it. So we actually helped, and we, we helped write a couple of bills. Uh, and I've gone up, and I've testified in House Judiciary Committees as well as Senate Judiciary Committees uh, against uh, what the LGBT is trying to push for here. All right, so what's been the outcome? Well, the outcome here is, praise God for this, is that we have a governor who signed the first bill was the adoption bill, which says that the adoption agencies cannot be forced to adopt children out to LGBT couples if they don't want to. Um, we then had a, that bill that says that boys cannot play sports on the girls' teams. He signed that, and that, pa- that passed, and he signed it. He signed a bill that says that LGBT st- um, lessons cannot be taught in public schools here, and if they do teach it, they have to inform the parents within 30 days, give them 30 days' notice, and give an opt-out for their children. And if they opt them out, the schools cannot give busy work for those children just because they opt out of that. So basically what we've done here is, and it's something I've preached. Uh, you might remember Dr. Brown when they gave that flyer to my seven-year-old promoting condoms. Yeah. Um, that there can be no sexualizing of children in the schools in Tennessee, and that is a result of only three or four of us going up to the to, going up to our state capitals, taking the time to sit down with our legislators and showing them evidence and helping them draft legislation. And the interesting thing is, Dr. Brown, is that our governor's sister is a lesbian. Mm. Right. And so it's, it's, it's not about – and that's the whole thing. It's not about hating people. It's simply it's, – right. and, and look, if some guy, for whatever reason, wants to dress up at a drag queen and go to a drag queen bar, you're not trying to tackle him as he goes into the bar. Uh, if whatever he wants to do, he does, that's, it's his life. It's his right. You know, if someone gets drunk, if someone gets high, if someone's sleeping with their girlfriend, well, that's – as long as it's not breaking the law. But when you are going right. to impose this on children – or are you going to have an agenda in schools imposed on children or just sexualizing children? You're not sending your kid to first grade or, or the that's fifth right. grade for these purposes. So that's all you're saying, that don't sexualize the children and don't push this perverse agenda on little ones. It's that simple. It, it's not, you know, here's what we say when they always say, oh, you're pushing a religion. I say, no, actually, uh, if you, know, you were not parading in the streets, especially in front of children, I wouldn't be here. It's not like I'm going knocking on people's doors and saying, hey, cut that out. I'm doing, I only, we only go and preach public events, things that happen publicly. Not, we don't go to private home. Again, you just said it best. A grown adult has the right to do whatever they want as long as it's legal. If they, if they choose to go and, and sin, that's on them. But children haven't made that choice on their own yet, and that's whom we have to protect. Right. That's what it comes down to. You know, Rich— there is a friend of mine who's been a frontline activist e- even before me in terms of the culture wars and, and gay lesbian issues. And he, it's really tough. I've been with him. He's got almost no income for it. He's hated. He's maligned. He's been given a, 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 per, a perverse nickname. You know, and I said to him one day, why don't you stop? I mean, I wanted to hear his response. He said, I'll stop when they stop because I, I didn't start this. I've told people, look, the water is coming in the boat. We, we, we got to pump the water out of the boat. We, did, we didn't start this in this regard. So you're talking about yeah. public events and you're talking about sexualizing of children, things in our schools. And for the most part, things are worse in most of our schools than most parents realize. And either the, kid, exactly right. either the kids aren't communicating about it or they don't have the capacity to share it or it's just so normal in the world where they are. You know, I was just reading something and we got a break. We'll, we'll come back on the other side of the break. But um, just reading something about an, an elite school in, in New York or somewhere, and they were getting into all this pornographic stuff with the students and, and, and on and on. And the students are saying, well, we all know about porn. Everybody knows about porn, but why this stuff? I'm thinking, that's just the norm. Everybody knows about it. In other words, it, it is so pervasive in this world, so much perversion. And now you bring it in in a formalized way in the schools. Something happened with Rich's daughter. We talked about that some months back. Uh, We'll be right back. Be encouraged.
maybe you've heard it sung, l'chaim, l'chaim to life, l'chaim, l'chaim to life. Maybe you've seen a Jewish toast or participated, l'chaim, l'chaim. It is literally to life, chaim, life, and le to, l'chaim. So there are verses in the Bible that talk about something leading to life. For example, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 19, it says this, whoever is steadfast in righteousness will live, but he who perceives evil pursues evil will die. And, it, and it's literally, it is to life. Whoever is steadfast in righteousness, it is to life. But it has come to mean something more than that. It, it is a toast. It is an expression of, of hope, l'chaim, that all will be well for you, that you'll be blessed. L'chaim is not just that you live, but that you live a good life that you live a blessed life, that you live a, a life of, of health and safety, the kinds of things that you would wish for someone. Here, just think of this. If, if, if I ask you, hey, here's a young couple and they're getting married, would you pray a blessing over them? What would you pray? Lord, may their love deepen over the years. May, may their union be unbreakable. May they experience your favor. May you bless them with health. May you bless them with children. May you grant them the holy desires of their heart. You know, you pray those kinds of things over someone. You bless them. That's l'chaim in essence. That's what it's all about. And, and I can say that for every person because that's my desire, that their lives would be in harmony with God and in harmony with God, therefore, be blessed. But a Jewish atheist could use it because it's not just a religious expression. It's an expression of well-being. So to all of you watching, to life, to life, l'chaim, that's my heart prayer for you. National speaker and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. I'm speaking with street preacher, Warriors for Christ, Rich Penkoski, about some landmark bills passed in Tennessee. These are not hate bills. These are bills to protect children. It's all that they're about, fairness to children, bills against sexualizing of children, and bills that were prompted by public displays that we should all label as perverse. If, if you can't label what drag queens are doing in front of little children perverse, then I say there's something wrong with your morals and your ethics, period. That simple. And, and Rich, you wanted to mention something that happened in Ohio. And they have to, I want to go back to, to what happened with your teenage daughter in yeah. school. But tell us about Ohio. So in Ohio, they had a, was it, what they're redoing now, it's called Drag Me to Brunch. And what they're doing is private business who are sympathetic to the LGBT are having brunches now where they're bringing these children in. And in Ohio, specifically, one of our street preaching brethren, uh, they were up there, and he got it on video. And it was a, uh, a, young, a young woman came out, or a, I, maybe 30 years old, and she had put on a fake male appendage. And she started making sexual motions in front of children. Uh, she even had a teenage girl grab it and pretend or simulate with her hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is children. She went to our street preaching brother. And she had actually went, tried to get get to his 13-year-old daughter. And he said, don't talk to my daughter. She's a kid. And she said, oh, I'm going to get to your daughter. And she started using her hips and making sexual most gestures in front of his child. Mm. Mm. So what did he do? There is an investigation by uh, what well, he called the police. Yeah. The police came over. And, of course, the officer on scene, uh, he thought it was a big joke. However, there is an investigation going right now. Uh, and it looks like there's going to be an arrest because Ohio has a law about doing things that appeal to the purian interest of a child. Really? Which is one law that we helped pass, by the way, as well. If you remember a couple of years ago, there was a uh, person who brought a kid into a bar and dressed him in drag and started dancing around in dollar bills, uh, you know, down his pants. And we had actually shared it. We had gotten a video and we shared it. And two Republican lawmakers were there were so discussed what they saw they actually passed a bill about sexualizing children in bars and whatnot and uh again not doing things that appeal to the pure interest of a child or stimulating sex act in front of a child yeah i mean this 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 again is morality ethics parenting 101 something that every one of us should agree on 
What happened uh, some months back uh, before COVID shut down and things with your daughter wearing a, a T-shirt to school? Yeah, I, I, I can give the facts, of it, but I can't talk too much because there is an ongoing federal lawsuit with that. So yep. uh, what, what I could talk about what was what's already been reported. And my daughter, Brielle, she, uh, she was in a classroom and uh, her teacher was openly homosexual and he had a pride symbol uh, displayed on his wall. And she had wanted to put a Christian flag or something next to it. You know, after all, equal, equal treatment, right? They said no. So she asked me if she can wear this T-shirt that says homosexuality is a sin and with the verse 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 underneath it. And I asked her, I said, are you sure you want to do that? Are you aware of the possible repercussions? She said, yes, it just doesn't seem fair that kids can walk around with their rainbow shirts and their pride shirts. And, you know, it's not fair. So she, she wore the shirt and was asked to leave school. Uh, and they said that the word, and you'll love this, Dr. Brown. Yeah, I remember. The word homosexuality was sexually connotative. And right. in fact, you're the one who pointed out that homosexuals always say it's not about sex, but that's exactly what it appears to be in this case. Right. So they said, in other words, no, it's it, the shirt would have been fine, but because it used the word sex, we can't have that in the school. Right. With a 16-year-old Correct. in the school. So a- anyway, um, you know, we, we talked, and she she was clear-headed about it, about what the consequences could be. And hey, look, this these are her biblical beliefs. But again, it wasn't provoking a fight. It was saying, we're bombarded with one message, one message, one message, which is a direct attack on things I believe and a mockery of what I believe. That's what she's saying. So, you know, where's something that says what I believe? Right. And it should be, hey, either nothing that sends any controversial message of any kind is allowed on any side, you know, from the teacher to the school to, or hey, it's free speech, right? As long as laws aren't well, broken. Here, here's what happened. But here's what happened as a result of that. So the kids, I guess there's like two or three um, kids who identify as LGBT in the school, and they tried starting a a gay club as a direct result of her filing a federal lawsuit. Well, because of her shirt, her boldness, and again, she just wore a T-shirt. She didn't even say anything. Mm -hmm. The other kids pushed back and said, no, we don't want this in our school. And it created a big thing, and police had to come in else because the kids, and again, it was nonviolent, but the kids just said, no, we've had enough of this. And right. put, stood up against it and, and you know, pushed back. Right. So it's it's the agenda, friends. That is the whole issue. You know, Rich is on the streets preaching because he wants to see people come to know Jesus. And you get a lot of flack and a lot of hate being out there. But but he and folks are going to do it. Everyone's going to do things differently, you know, in different callings, right. different expressions. But bottom line is they want to see people saved. You really, this is not what you want to be dealing with. This is not what you want to be focusing on. But when you're raising kids, when they're in school, when you see what's happening, there's a righteous indignation that rises up. So, Rich, we've been encouraging folks today with the cultural tide turning and the pushback that's at hand. So I so appreciate you coming on and sharing the good news from Tennessee. And let's make Jesus known. Let's stand up for what's right. I appreciate it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Brown. I appreciate you as well and everything you do. You're very welcome. God bless. Thank you, Lord. So so listen, let, let me say something to those who are watching and listening, maybe right wing watch, you've tuned in. Hey, folks, glad that you're watching. Maybe the YouTube reviewer that's going to watch this video to see if it's suitable for monetization. Maybe one of our regular gay listeners, you differ with me, but for whatever reason, you, you listen. Or maybe you're a pastor, you're trying to be very sensitive and gentle and not, not offend those with you know, gay kids or, or transgender relatives and things. Maybe you just say, hey, Dr. Brown, this is really wrong. We just just talk about Jesus. Don't talk about any of this stuff. Please hear me. This is not hate. This is not discrimination. This is not telling adults what they can and can't do in the privacy of their home or what relations they can and can't have. The law is not being broken. What they do is between them and God, right? You can be an atheist. You can be a Buddhist. You can be a Christian. You can be a Muslim. You can be a drug user, you can be an alcoholic, you can be an abstainer, you can have multiple partners, you can be celibate, you can, it's a free country as long as you're not breaking the law, right? But don't sexualize our children. You say, well, we're a gay couple and we're, we've adopted three kids and we're raising them and we love our kids. As mothers, we love our kids. And well, if you have the ability to do that, you're able to adopt children and it's, it's legal where you are, and you, you do what you do. I, I, I wish the children had a father. I wish they didn't grow up with that example, but I don't doubt that you're, you're loving, caring, or 
in your worldview, this is good for them and they're not being deprived or whatever, but don't push that on anybody else's children. No, I don't want an environment where when your kids go to school, if you're, you're two lesbians raising your kids together and your kids go to school, I don't want an environment where the kids get ridiculed and mocked and hate it because they have two mommies and the kids are mean to them. No, I want an environment where kids love them and kids care about them and befriend them as kids. That's the environment I want. But I do not want an environment either where the school is teaching, hey, you know, there's families with two mommies. No, I, I don't want that environment because that's not why they're in school. They're in school learn to, to read and, and write and, and learn history and math and whatever other basic things there are in basic science and biology, et cetera. They're not there to be sexualized. They're not there to, to be taught about condoms in elementary school. They're not there to, to be given vocabulary cards to understand the meaning of gender queer when they're seven years old. That's not why they're in school. So no, I don't want that imposed on the children. If, if my tax dollars are funding education, then by all means, I'm going to push back all the more. I'm, I'm going to have all the more resistance to those things and objection to those things. It's only natural that I do. And when you've got the obscenity, the perversion of these drag queen reading hours, that's exactly what it is. It's despicable that any parent would bring a little child to that. Well, I'll raise my voice against it. I don't hate the people involved. I want them to repent. I want them to know God. I, I want them to find freedom and wholeness and a life that makes sense. <clears throat> Yeah, so I, I am judging that lifestyle according to John 7, 24. Jesus saying, don't judge by outward appearance, make righteous judgment. I don't know what's in that person's heart. I don't know what motivates them. I don't know why this man feels the need to dress up as, as a woman in this extreme way, as a drag queen and so on, and put on these sexual displays in front of kids. I don't know what's motivating them, but it is sinful and is wrong, and they need to repent, and I'll speak out about that. But... I'm not, I'm not chasing people down and trying to look at how you're, oh, you're, you're, going to, you're going to the strip club. I'm going to stop you from going to the strip club. Oh, you're a stripper. I'm going to stop you from being a stripper. Oh, you're going to the bar and getting drunk. I'm going to stop. No, people are going to live how they live. I'm going to try to stop you from being an atheist. I'm going to stop you from, well, I don't like you going to that church. No, we're, people live how they live. Don't, don't confuse the issues. We're talking about sexualizing children. And we're saying, do what you need to do to take a stand in your community. Change can come if we get involved. One of my colleagues, very upset, he and his wife very upset with a video assignment that was given to them by a teacher. Girl, what, seven years old, I think? She's supposed to watch this video. The parent happened to put it on to see what it was. They was talking about how they felt watching what mood they're in. And leading up to the music video was an just bizarre gay themed, just like a stupid gay theme, transgender theme. I mean, it was stupidly done, and the themes were gay, transgender, and they were shocked. She's seven years old. So reached out very graciously, made an appointment to meet with the principal and the teacher. The teacher said, I didn't watch the whole video. I had no idea that that was there at the beginning. I thought it was just a music video. Apologies, we'll never do that again. Sometimes it's just a matter of awareness and involvement. But friends, be strong and have good courage. In Jesus' name, the tide is turning.